Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of y'all who don't know me, I'm Harlan Green, head of the Historical Commission. And thank you members for being here and thank you public for being here. So we've got a quorum and we'll call the meeting to order. And I'll remind y'all that when we speak, we've got these little green lights in front of us that we're supposed to press. And I'm assume press them when we don't speak. Um, so call to order is our first item of business, which you've done that. And second item on the agenda is presentation by the Board of Field Offices of the 4th Brigade and the South Carolina Battlefield Trust on the Hornwork in Marion Square. And it's a presentation for um, information only. Someone here to present? Good afternoon. I'm Tom Weinzer. I'm the chairman of the Board of Field Officers of the 4th Brigade. And uh, Mr. Boste couldn't make it today. He's a bit under the weather, so I'm it. And uh, he, he came to us last year with a, this proposal to place these markers on this, on Marion Square to uh, mark the remnants of the of the Hornworks walls that are still underneath the square, uh, mainly to well to mark a, the important uh, location of a, a very important structure on Charleston's history, and to also delineate those what remains and protect them from damage from tent stakes or whatever else might happen to be penetrating the ground on the square. And uh, also, uh, we're also going to have a, uh, in addition to the markers, there'll be three signs that will uh, be placed around the square. One will uh, define the the uh, the board of field officers and also the history of the horn work. And uh, one of the things that I think is really important is it's also going to be a, another place, another marker on the Liberty Trail in, in South Carolina to, to uh, for people to tour and visit important sites relating to revolution, especially coming up to the anniversary here in a few years of the, uh, the beginning of the revolution. And of course, Charleston has a significant place both at the beginning of the revolution and the end. And I think this, uh, this project with these markers and signs uh, will be an important uh, addition to the ambiance of Charleston and what I call Charleston surprises where people are wandering around and say, hey, this is really cool, look at this. And of course, we're also gonna have a visual representation uh, where they can, you can get an app on your phone to see what it would have looked like at that time. It was a very uh, impressive structure from what all the diagrams and what you see there too, uh, from what I've heard, that if you were in the, the bottom of the moat looking up, the top of the wall was 30 feet over your head, uh, 30 feet from the ground. So uh, it's gonna be an important project and I think it's gonna be add a lot to Charleston's uh, historical context in the worthwhile project. Uh, we reviewed it all. The uh, South Carolina Battlefield Trust has very experienced historians that reviewed all the information. And of course, uh, the members of the board Maybe not me so much, but everybody else grew up here and they know a lot about this stuff. So they re really, we picked it apart and made sure it was as accurate as we could get it. And I think it's going to be a significant and worthwhile project. I think it's going to be a great addition to the square. Anybody have any questions or anything? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A, this is exciting information. And and I echo your comments earlier, we, we do not do enough to recognize uh, Charleston's role in the American Revolution, the beginning or the, or the end, um, and we need to do a lot more. And I appreciate y'all's efforts on, on bringing that to, to light. Uh, is, is there any more information about, the, I mean, the horn works? I've, I've heard about it and know a little bit of, about it, but how significant was that um, to, to Charleston back at the, at the time? Well, the, the horn works at that time was, was the edge of the city. So it was kind of a gateway to the city, and it was a very large, impressive uh, structure that was built all with you know tabby and local materials. And there were people living; you could live inside it. It was big enough. There was an encampment inside it, and a deep, not they call it a moat, but it wasn't filled with water. It was a deep ditch around it, and uh, a gate with a drawbridge. And so it was the gate to the city, and it could. In my mind, it could cover the each river, probably within cannon shot of each river, uh, the Ashley and the Cooper. So I think it was a very important structure, even though after the war was over, 
they took it down as the city grew up, I guess, towards that area, and they felt it wasn't needed anymore. One thing I thought of is when they built this prior to the revolution, I didn't think they'd ever thought they'd have to be defending themselves from their own government, you know, which is what they actually were doing. But it's going to be a, an interesting uh, addition to the square, and I think it's worthwhile, and I'm glad we're, we're just really indebted to the Preservation Trust for you know, putting this forward and paying for it, evidently, you know. So they're paying for the whole thing. So it's really a worth, worthwhile thing. Do we know how far extended this fortification lasted? As, as far past? Uh, Nick, Nick, Nick or Dale might be no better than I would. Uh, uh, distance, how far did it go beyond what we know as Marion Square? That one picture, if you could show that back on there, we had that on the desk, council member, is um, shows the physical hardware, in other words, the real um, padding. Can you run that back to that first picture from the screen? Right. So it, 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 it went across King and almost the meeting, I think. I know. Uh, the remnants can still be found when they're digging even outside of Marion Square. There's still some under the streets, evidently, right? Yes. Yeah. There's some in the in the yard of uh, St. Matthew's Church. But that far over. Yes, sir. Interesting. And I think they found um, defensive um, outposts in when they were doing a dig at the Aiken Rett House as well, too. They actually saw that there was some ditch work um, there as well, even before you get to the um, horn works. Um, so I'm assuming you will be coming back before this committee with the plaques themselves or? Well, if I can, if uh, we would be glad to, once we get them, they're under manufacture right now. And uh, our wish was to hopefully get them installed before Victory Day in December. That remains to be seen, but they're, they are in the works. And if it's a possibility, I would certainly do that. I mean, it's an odd thing. You know, we're in charge of, of approving um, language on things in the public sphere with the Marion Square being an odd combination of, you know, not actually owned by the city, but just managed or used by the city. So I'm not sure if we would have um, the authority to, um, to, to um, rule on those words. Well, they were, everything was very carefully vetted and the South Carolina Preservation Trust has very experienced historians and, and everyone on the board uh, me, not so much, but everybody else would have been chairman of the board at one time or another. So very experienced and very knowledgeable of what, what goes on there. And I think we got it as accurate as we could get it. Right. Well, that's great. We're also grammarians. Um, yeah. Wilmot, and if you remember to turn your green light on. The um, reference to ownership of Marion Square by a military organization, which is um, by necessity uh, subordinate to a state or other citizen controlled entity, um, is something I think that we really need to explore very carefully before we get our hands in this or, or not. Um, but it is very important to, to note that it's unlikely that the a military organization um, on its own has control of a, of a piece of real estate that um, normally would be seen as owned by the political and state entity that surrounds it and, and, and controls it in, in the United States. So um, I would, I would say we should look very carefully at the ownership question of Marion Square. Another thing I'd like to, to bring to your attention is the issue of who built these fortifications, um, who actually built them. Uh, most of it was probably done by African labor, um, uh, by enslaved people. And the very material tabby uh, is, is a 
is a, is a kind of African derived product that I've seen um, along the fortifications along the coast of West Africa that were used in the, in the international slave trade. So I would um, uh, say that in whatever, whatever examination you do of this, of the one work, um, these issues be, be confronted uh, squarely so that in the future we know who the land belongs to and who the um, who who built the, right built the home. Well, I think we, uh, quite well taken, but I excuse me. I do believe you know the you know the, it is private property. Um, it is owned in trust by an organization, um, and the city, is my understanding, is just leases it and maybe manages it or does or do, doesn't even lease it. D Dale, can you clear that up? Dale Teeling, Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to go into any level of detail of interest uh, as far as Marion Square to Fourth Brigade. You have the chairman here. He he should have the floor, but a very quick answer to the question about initial construction, the British built. Mm -hmm. Now, who the British had, whether they had um, enslaved people with them, this is, this is the British when everything was British. Yeah, when, when this yeah. is before the revolution. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. And um, who, whether they had enslaved people from, you know, what you would consider local or whether they had uh, folks from Britain come over and build it, civilians or otherwise. I don't know that answer, but it was initially constructed and later improved by the British. When the British held Charleston, they went back and improved it even more to defend Charleston as a, under British control. As far as I know, we don't have a record of who worked on it, but we did make sure that in one of the discs that said, when they would talk about, would mention building it, we, we did make sure that it said it including many enslaved people because undoubtedly they were involved. I can't see any reason why they wouldn't be, you know, unfortunately involved in that, but there's undoubtedly they were involved in the, you know, the ownership issue. That's for the lawyers to decide, I guess, but, uh, and it's been in this, it's been this way for 190 years. So, uh, and, and on the agenda, and sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to point on the agenda, you know, no action is necessary for this. This is just being presented to us for information. And I do think it would, it will fill up, we can take note. Um, and again, I'm just trying to see whether we appreciate the information, we appreciate the presentation. And, you know, it may be beyond our ken since it is actually private property um, for us to rule on it, but we certainly do appreciate it for information. And Nick? Mr. Chairman, I just want to address a couple of things that just came up and add a little bit of information and ask a question. Um, first of all, a couple of years ago, I did three podcasts for my podcast, Charles and Time Machine. And if you're interested, it's episode 160, 161, 162 on Charleston Time Machine, Charleston County Public Library. Tell you everything you wanna know about the horn work, including who labored on it. It was combination of enslaved people and British regular soldiers in 1757, 58, 59. And all the details about why it survived and so forth. And that research I've shared with Doug Bostic and with the South Carolina Battlefield Preservation Trust and that research forms the basis of the information before us now. And I understand it's Tom's presenting it for information only right now, but I just wanted to say there are a couple of typos in the blonde, bronze plaques that you shared with us. And I know those aren't uh, up for discussion at the moment, but uh, if you want to talk about those, there are a couple of there are a couple of mistakes. Um, but Tom and I can talk about that later uh, after I, the meeting. I, or some other to time. be honest, I'm not sure if it's if we can get them corrected at this point. But yep. we'll, we'll talk it over. Okay. okay. All right. That's fine. Fair enough. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to, to come here and talk to you. No, we appreciate it and we look forward to it. And, and do you have just roughly idea of any idea? It would be great before the anniversary. Uh, uh, we hope so. Yeah. Well, I'm sure. It, we're hoping, we were always hoping to get it done by the end of this year, but the process. Right. You know. Councilman? Mr. Chairman, I, I would just respectfully request that while the issue, we have jurisdiction over the wording or the placement may be outside of our purview, I still would think it would be appropriate for, that we did pass on it. Um, this is a, a public square. It is a widely accessible public square. Uh, folks don't pay attention as to the legal necessities 
uh, whether or not it's in this purview in the jurisdiction of the city or not. Uh, this commission may not have the legal ability to do that, but I perhaps y'all would be welcome to and open to that idea that we did offer some recommendations and suggestions to it. It, it would provide a level of consistency at the very least if we did that and that we did have put our stamp of approval or disapproval on. I think that would be, if y'all are willing to do that, uh, I would appreciate the opportunity to review it. Well, I think the board would welcome, you know, your stamp of approval, you know, it's just, uh, we're pretty far along in the process, but, uh, you know, we, but we've always worked well with the city and, and everything we do there. And this would just be another step in the process here, just to make sure that everything gets done right. Yeah. So, well, if you can keep us informed and, you know, if the die literally has not been cast um, and if it's not being cast in stone okay. or in bronze yet, <laughs> um, you know, we generally meet, you know, there is time to, um, to bring it before us. You know, we, you know, we often meet the first week, first Wednesday of the month, but again, it's a great project. Um, we, you know, and I think um, um, the councilman's um, um, suggestion is good just for the sake of uniformity. It might be nice. Um, we have been asked to weigh in on opinions before on things, you know, specifically, um, you know, on Calhoun and a variety of other things as well. Um, just like that, again, just in an ancillary um position and not necessarily ruling on it. But if there's time, I think I'm speaking for the commission that we'd be very happy to review it if there is time. Okay. And I would suggest getting those typo um, 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 suggestions from Dr. Butler. Well, we, we'll check it out and then we'll do, we'll do what we can at this point. So we'll just have to see how we can go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming and thank Doug, Doug Boskett for us and hope he's feeling better. Okay. So second order of business is um, C.A. Brown. Um, that's the order that they're coming in. Um, and I assume these, you know, as you well know, these have been submitted by the South Carolina Department of Archives and History, um, sponsored by the C.A. Brown High School Alumni Association. Um, and is there anyone here to speak for that plaque? Or we, you know, we don't necessarily need it, but I was just going to ask if anyone was here for that. Usually the state archives just sends it along for us. So that's fine. So I will open it up to discussion if people, um, if we want to start with C.A. Brown High School, the plaque side one, do people have any thoughts or um, suggestions for rewording or um, is it fine the way it is? And maybe for the sake of the people in the audience, I'll read it. C.A. Brown High School. This campus was built in 1962 as a high school for African-American residents of Charleston's East Side. Initially known as East Side High School, it was named for longtime school board chairman Charles A. Brown soon after opening. The 57 classroom brick facility originally fronted Blake Street and included a cafetorium, gymnasium, and, industri and industrial shop. Approximately, and abbreviated, 1,400 students in grades 8 through 12 attended the school in its first year. The first principal was Nathaniel L. Manigo. Any, I'll give you all time to um, read it over, but we do have a full agenda. So if, um... then real quick, I'm then having some technical difficulties with the screen. So it looks different from what it is on the page, but if we need to edit it, I can edit it up there. Okay, great. Review, I'm sure I could yeah, technical enlarge it and everything. A whole lot helpful. I mean, I forget it was in the email, I only read that too. I think they did actually um, have um, it highlighted. Philip, do you have that in all the attachments? Thank you. Meanwhile, while Philip's looking for the image of it, if people have any suggestions for the text. And if they don't, um, you know, we can. Um, so I've got the. Um, not to interrupt Mr. Chairman, but uh, here I can share it onto the, but it was just this part. I don't think it says anything in okay. specific marker to be located at 25 Blake Street and interpret the school's right. original use as a segregated black high school serving residents of the east side neighborhood research files for that project. Then you all received those in the email. Right. I knew there was something there too. So I mean, we could Google Earth 25 on um, Blake Street, but I guess that's the answer, Angela. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. the corner of America uh, and, and Blake. And yes. Blake. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Um, if if there's no um, why, if there's if there's no issues with side one, why don't we go to side two and then maybe um, have a um, and and maybe uh, entertain a motion to do it all at one time. Yeah, just for clarification. So we do want to reference the campus and as well as the high school, right? The actual location and not just the building. Is that the intention? Oh, I'm sorry. We want and turn on the green light. Hit the green light. Okay. Yes, too many choices. So just to make sure you the the site or the people who are involved with this want the campus as well as the building to be recognized, correct? Not just the building. I'm just asking that for clarification. This campus was built in 1962 as a high school. And I'm ignorant up, forgive me, that I don't know if the um, gymnasium, cafetorium, and industrial shop were, are all in the same building under the same roof, or, or they are part buildings. of the campus. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, and again, I'm just not familiar enough with the structure. I'm not either. Um, you know, to know that. Um, and I think there's just one structure now. I think there is, yeah. Yeah, it's just one big structure, basically. And I don't know if that's, if anything's been taken down, or if it all was under one roof. Yeah. Um, so do people object to the idea of campus since I guess it it, no. it it assumes contiguous land? Yeah, I mean, I think it's accurate. And I just wanted to make sure that that's what we all agree to. Fine. Okay. Is there anyone here? No one's here from the... From the State Archives. No, they vet this. Um, um, so, and they did send in, um, you know, supporting information. As I remember, it was mostly newspaper clippings, et cetera, et cetera, not all printed yeah. out. So when the State Archives does submit this, they do have, and it would have been in your packet, um, your email packet, you know, of all the background information as well. The reason I'm asking a question, Chairman, is that uh, the guy, the gentleman who was the bandmaster at CA Brown, uh, is, is a friend of mine, and um, he indicated that at one point he was forced into a situation where the students couldn't practice their instruments. And so they built a separate structure for the band after repeated disturbances of other activity and uh, because of practicing. And so I don't know whether that band structure uh, was included in the in the in the structures that were delineated and, and named, but it would be worth whoever constructed this description uh, uh, their time to check on it, mm -hmm. since the school did include arts and instrumental music. And I think the way the process goes, Wilmot, is the um, C.A. Brown High School Alumni Association would have sent all the information and a suggestion for the text to the um, Department of Archives and History. They would then have vetted that text and they would have, you know, reduced it down to the characters per line and they would have sent it back to the Alumni Association for their approval, you know, the people who are sponsoring I'm just the project. Yeah. The Alumni Association is aware of that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, fact, I, because as, as I said, this was, this was from someone who, in fact, right. used the facility. Yeah. And yeah, and I'm he, unaware he, of that. And he made, you know. made a point in my discussions with him of, 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 uh, Making me aware of the fact yeah. that there was a, a separate yeah. structure right. built for a right. man. Yeah, I at wish that, I, at that location. All I can say is I wish he was here. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's something that's worth right. It's something that's right. worth uh, worth for accuracy's sake. Yeah, and for an understanding of what kind of programmatic activity took place there. Yeah, I think it's important as well. David. Yeah, this will come up in the next one also. Um, I don't know whether archives is beginning to use um, abbreviations, um, yeah. but I don't even know if a prox is a legitimate uh, abbreviation. Why don't you change it and put about? I was gonna say- or just, use, or just use circa. About, people know about yeah. more than they do circa. And that is the same is, number in this of- current place. But anyway, I would move to do that. So, so, I, so that would be line 14, 
um, Philip, yes. instead of saying approx P R O O R X period, we would say about 1400 students in grade. Does anybody know if, if approx is a legitimate um, Nick? I mean, you ever I, seen that? I saw that too, and I wondered. I mean, I had flagged it too, but. It doesn't sound to me. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. I must not have caught that. Yeah. But I mean, so then, so then, would. So we'll put that in there, and then when we vote on the thing there, we'll, we'll read the entire word back and see a motion. So at this point, we're amending side one and taking a prox and making that to about. Anyone have any thoughts on side two? And I'll read it for the public. Um, C.A. Brown High School's mascot was the Panthers, and its colors were black and gold. The school remained predominantly black after Charleston County schools were integrated in 1970. C.A. Brown's last senior class graduated in 1982 when it and Charleston High School were merged into Burke High School. Burke briefly held ninth and 10th grade classes here. Trident Technical College acquired the C.A. Brown property in 1984 and moved its downtown Palmer campus here in 1986. Period. Hmm. Millicent? I didn't think so. Yeah. And you should know. <laughs> so for the record, that's Millicent Brown, who was the first student to integrate, um, was it Rivers? It, the, you know, the um, white Charleston schools as well. Mr. Chairman, so Council Member Shade we, has his hand up. Uh, pardon? I, I, I just have a clarif uh, clarification question. Is the, the name of the school officially Charles A. Brown High School, or is the official name of the school C.A. Brown High School? I've always heard it as C.A. Brown. I have too. And I would defer to other people. I mean, and, you know, it says it's sponsored by the C.A. Brown High School Alumni Association, which I assume is their official name, I would assume. Um, but, you know, so, so that's the sponsoring organization. And I have seen the sponsoring organization, I think, in two lines, if it was necessary to, um, to do it. So, and, and I guess this is going to get thrown into two lines, but I guess smaller font. So we should certainly change 1970 to 1963. <laughs> Oops. Um, any other thoughts on side two? Hearing none, um, if y'all want to do it, but then um, once people do think um, we can entertain a motion to um, do the plaques with the words that we have inserted. Is that a, mo is, is that a motion, David? So we do have a motion that we would change side one approx to about, we would change 1970 to 1963. Do we have a second? Is there any more discussion? For clarification, I believe, and I may be incorrect, uh, if there's a parliamentarian here, I believe we can only motion to defer if there's already a motion on the table, or at least the only thing you can vote on would be a motion to defer. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. right. He didn't imagine it'd be uh, there in the first from right. from the beginning. So it's the kind of thing that um, it's it's an interesting story and an important aspect of the curriculum, right? So, it, it, so it being the be, poor parliamentarian that I am, um, we have I a motion. We have a motion to defer, um, or we we need to. 
you would have to have a second on the motion to defer, right. and then that would take right. precedence. But right. otherwise, if there is Thank no second, you. there Thank would you, be Phil. no. So we have a motion to defer. Do we have a second motion to defer? Anyone second? Okay, so we have so um, so we will so then um, people want to vote on that. Then any more discussion? Well, I think well, I think defer would be that yes, we would defer that motion that we just made, um, and then we would probably come up with another motion, and that would be maybe to go back to them, and it would be another meeting. That is my understanding of what we're voting on right now. So any more discussion? So for the vote to defer, every, if everyone wants to um, defer the motion, the first motion, please say aye. Aye. And oh, so maybe you have to raise hands. <laughs> so please raise hands. To defer. To defer. To defer. So we have one, two, three, four. And how many of us are here? So. Does that carry? The motion passes. Okay. So now we, so that is deferred. So do we want to bring another motion as to what we want to do with this plaque? Wilmot? If it's, if the motion to defer passed, then the, the motion was actually to defer with regard to mention of the band structure. Well, I think, no, it was just the motion the first motion that we made to accept it as amended, that has been deferred. Yeah. So now we need another point of action. And so then if someone wants to suggest what that point of action would be, like, do we go back, do we send this back to the state archives with a suggestion that they, um, that they investigate that or that? So, you know, I mean, we do need to, we, you know, it would be great to take some action. Um, I would move that the, Material be sent, uh, returned to the state archives for examination of the facts regarding a band structure uh, that was erected at the CA Brown. And for the record, can you give us the name of the inf the person that they could possibly get the information from? Sure. So, uh, be because of uh, information furnished to the commission member by Mr. George Kenny, who was director of, of new bands and music. And can you spell his last name? I just want to make sure that, that we might have a source of contact so the state archives could get in touch with yeah, him. Yeah, he told me that story in reg with regard to uh, some research I was doing. Right. On. And was it Kenny, did you say, George? Kenny, K-E-N-N-Y. K-E-N-N-Y, okay. So, so we have a first. Does anyone want to second that motion? Second, any discussion? So now we can vote on that motion. Everyone in favor of sending this back to the state archives for them to consider information about the band building, perhaps going through Mr. Kenny, please say aye. aye. Or raise their hand, I guess, now to two. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So I guess the motion carries. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Nays. And any abstentions? Okay, so we may see you next month. Um, next on the order of business is Gibbs Landing. Why don't I, um, again, just read it first for the people here. At the mouth of this tidal creek is the colonial era site of Gibbs Landing. Located on a low buff, bluff off the Ashley River, it was part of the plantation owned by John Gibbs and known as Orange Grove or, or The Grove. In spring 1780, British and Hessian soldiers encamped at the plantation after marching south down the Charleston Neck. The landing subsequently became an important supply point for the siege of Charleston, one of the worst patriot losses of the American Revolution. The only suggestion I have is, and that's a question, is siege capitalized? You know, that should be the title of a name or something. So um, it's, I think in this case, siege is capitalized because through historical usage over the past two 
centuries. It has become a proper noun like the like Battle of Brandywine or, or okay. the Battle of Waterloo, what have you. Any other thoughts on side one, Angela? So, and maybe this is a not a very bright question, but why is it titled Gibbs Landing, I guess, just for the location as opposed to Siege of Charleston? Should it? I mean, I'm just wondering, because we, we often have markers that reflect an event as opposed to the site, right? Gibbs Landing really doesn't mean a whole lot to a lot of people. Siege of Charleston does. Well, but then you can say in the body that it's Gibbs Landing. Harlan, it's yeah, kind Mr. Of Chair. That we do have someone from the Preservation yes. Society to present. Okay. Thank Hi. you so much. Hurts. I'm Anna Catherine Carroll with the Preservation Society of Charleston, and this marker is sponsored by the Preservation Society and the Marsh Project. My colleague, Dr. Blake Scott, is also here to answer any questions, but um, as you move into side two to address your question, um, the the marker does focus specifically on the evolution of the site in addition to its revolutionary era significance. And sorry, I've got very poor um, so, side light vision. Well, just, just at a point of interest, um, where the British landed uh, sent the cannons and everything across the river is actually where a magnolia plantation is. And there is, sorry, where the British departed to get to Gibbs Landing was is now where magnolia plantation is. There is a marker at the plantation, um, um, I guess, path where you go around through the right where they left or embarked from to go to Gibbs Landing. So just out of curiosity, I mean, that's kind of an interesting hidden yeah. nothing to change on it. I mean, that would be great for mapping purposes, especially when the Revolutionary War, when all the sites are celebrated. It'd be great to, you know, mark it on both ends. Apparently the owner of Magnolia at the time was a British sympathizer. So he let the troops use his property in order to ferry all the material across. And, and Please. Do you know if that was called Lenning's Creek by chance? Pardon me? Do you know if that would have been called Lenning's Creek by chance or something along? I don't remember what was on the plaque. I just remember when we were walking along the path and stopped and said, this is from, from this point okay. where they embarked to um, uh, ship the material. Across okay. The on a previous draft of the marker that the state had proposed, something along those lines were included, but it ended up getting cut for word count. But it would be really straightforward if it were to be reintroduced, that could be explored, but it does get really tricky with getting all the pertinent information in there with the limited. I didn't, I didn't bring it up to change it. I was bringing it up for information. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Councilman? So while, while you're standing, <laughs> where is this marker going? This marker will be placed on 10th Avenue in the Wagner Terrace neighborhood, right on Halsey Creek, which is an important point of connection to the water. So, so was there, just out of curiosity, because by two unofficial historians from West Ashley are behind me, and um, there was a marker that we talked about a while back. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I get too far off the field. But was there a crossing from 10th Avenue over the, on the other side of the Ashley to Orange Grove Road. And if you want to use the microphone. I'm here with Anna Catherine. I'm at the College of Charleston. My name is Blake Scott. I, I teach history there. Uh, we did research for this plaque and they were also using what was the site of Old Charlestown Landing right. as a main uh, supply point to get across the Ashley. And they were landing at what was Grove Plantation because it was very short and they'd actually come from uh, Wapu Creek, and then and then come up the Ashley, and then across to avoid uh, to avoid the Hornworks. Right, so that's what made Gibbs Landing very important. And then uh, Sir Henry Clinton was had his headquarters at the Grove Plantation, and they moved their line across the Cooper from that location. Um, but the West Ashley location was key for uh, moving goods across. So it was a West Ashley location at the present site of Charlestown Landing? I believe so. Perhaps Dr. Butler can speak to that as well, but um, from our records, it was Charlestown, line, Charles, Charlestown Landing. Right, and, and the reference to Lenning Creek. It's that, right. 
yeah. that Anna Catherine mentioned. That's uh, what is now Old Town Creek. Right. I thought so. And Ghost Island and around. And Ghost there. Island, right. right. And right there next to that. Right, right next to Charlestown Landing. Um, so, yeah, that was the staging point. And there, it's just a coincidence, Peter, that there was a Orange Grove on the other side of the Ashley River as well. The Orange Grove is all over the place in the early colonial period. Um, so Orange Grove Road west of the Ashley is just contemporary with the Orange Grove on Grove Street. If I could just believe this is a little bit more, Mr. Chairman. So um, the other interesting point of this was um, that uh, when I attended the victory uh, celebration several years ago, the question came up as to, we knew the British troops, I mean, the, the American um, Army, Continental Army, moved into the peninsula on that day in December. And that I presume, Mr. Dr. Butler, that that came from, where we were told it came from West Ashley. Would that have been from the Charlestown Landing site? Yeah, from uh, from several sites west of the Ashley, as uh, Dr. Blake was saying just a moment ago as well, coming through the Wapu, because they came up the Stono River through the Wapu and then back down the Ashley uh, to land on the neck. So, so uh, Mr. Chairman, part of all this discussion is, is that in West Ashley, and we will hear some more markers in a few seconds, um, but we, these are not notified, these are not um, marked as to the significance that Charlestown Landing has on our early history beyond it being the site of the original settlement. So these are important facts that probably we need to be exploring some more as to the significance of Charlestown Landing site. And we've had several discussions over the years with what we call um, Ghost Island mm -hmm. um, and the significance of that. Right. And that had been some controversy over, over a period of time. This is why I'm on this commission, I suspect, because of my uh, rep representing this part of West Ashley in particular. Um, but so th these discussions are important that, that we can maybe further some other discussion down the road. So I appreciate your indulgence on me asking these questions. And um, Dr. Butler, thank you. And thank you all for the clarification on, on a lot of that. And with people from the Battlefield Trust and with the revolution coming up anniversary, you know, I think it's information well received because, you know, um, this, you know, I assume Charlestown Landing County Park these days, State Park state but still they would fall under if someone wanted to put a plaque up there um that i think that would fall within our province as well to do it so if anyone knows and people associated there so back to text um any other thoughts on side one um so we're going to we understand why it's called gibbs landing and not siege of charleston um siege is capitalized um, if there's no other thoughts or debates on side one, we can move to side two, and I'll read it again. Um, from the river's west bank, British forces ferried artillery, provisions, and trench building materials to Gibbs Landing, the next closest firm landing to Charleston proper. Sailors and enslaved people then moved the supplies to other positions nearby. British forces besieged the city for six weeks and occupied it until December, abbreviated 1782. Any remnants of the landing were likely lost when this creek was flooded to create temporary Lake Juanita for the 1901-02 Charleston Exposition. I know, David, you had some thoughts about um, the abbreviation of December. Um, yes, in order to uh, not abbreviate- And if you could speak a little, sorry, if you could come- In order to not abbreviate December, um, if you go to line eight and remove the word then, I think you could then move moved up to that in the line and you would be able to eventually print December out rather than having it as an abbreviation. So I would move to delete then and request that archives spell out December as opposed to having a, an abbreviation for it. Any objections to that? Um, any other thoughts among the commission members? I'll give you time. On that point or another? Um, any, that or any. The terminology west of the Ashley and, the, and the, on the other side of the Ashley, we're talking about the 
two different river banks, you know, so far today. And the grove is a common term on the peninsula as well. You know, we're talking about what's commonly known as Lounge Grove area. Yes, there, um, Mary Anna Catherine and Doc. Yeah. Okay. And and you say Tenth Avenue and what corner or what? The uh, the, the closest um, intersection would be Tenth and Gordon, but it's Gordon. it's squarely on Tenth Avenue. There's a okay. promenade okay. which gives you a, a nice view of the creek all the way to the Ashley River and across. Well, um, is the term? I'm just asking for history's sake. The term the Grove. Does that relate to Lounge Grove, or was there an Orange Grove originally in some sense? Well, the, the name has changed several several times over the centuries of use, um, but it was known as the Grove at that point. Um, later it becomes Lounge Grove, but Lounge uh, was a, a politician who comes after the revolution. So we tried to stick to some of the, the contemporary names of the time period. He was a well. military officer. And, and a congressman as well, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. So do people have any other thoughts or suggestions for changes on either side one or side two? Chairman on line 13, any, was a typo? Yeah, there is a typo there, any remnants, it should be an N, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. It only says any any romance and assuming that that will um, not throw the line, but then good catch. It, we have once tried to um, correct a typo with an already cast um, um, monument. It was it was hard, but it was done um, at a cost. Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the text as amended. Okay, and those amendments being on side two that we remove the word then from line eight and put an N in remnants and on line 13 and spell out December on Correct. line 13? Correct. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Any more discussion? Anyone in favor, please raise their hand. Anyone against or abstain? So I think we have it. So now we're gonna um, move on to the Carr Richardson Maryville presentation. Um, and we, I, we have lots of smart people here about that. I'll just say for information, um, I think today y'all, there was an enormous number of plaques that are almost ready. Um, I think today the decision was just to work on the Mary plaques, as we call it, just because, um, you know, we're starting late in the day. Um, but I don't know if people representing Maryville, Ashleyville, someone would like to come up and talk about it. And, and I just want to say, you know, we have been very involved in this so far. And, um, you know, we have always talked about the importance of noting, you know, the racist um, unincorporating of this um, of this of this municipality and just fyi if you read the entire attachments you would see that that information is brought up in the larger sign so you know if we don't see it there in the mary in the mary signs that is very amply um that that information that information will be supplied in that park as well if i'm correct oh thank you good evening um mrs green and uh, members of the history commission I'm Marsha Higgins, president of the Maryville Ashleyville Neighborhood Association. And my comments this evening is just to say that we were first before you in June of 2022. And we have followed your recommendations uh, from that meeting. And also, Mr. Green gave some input to us uh, in terms of you know, just how to word the information. We have followed all of those recommendations and uh, we are prepared today to discuss the three Marys. And so uh, it's our pleasure to entertain your questions. It was quite an experience <laughs> for us, <laughs> and um, but we certainly enjoyed it and um, to present the history of 
the town of Maryville. Thank you. Yes, and I think it's a very vital history to have. And you all share our frustration of trying to get a lot of information in a small place. So um, so we're starting with the Mary Ellen, according to the agenda, we're starting with the Mary Ellen Green Car plaque, no relation. Um, You'll have to bring it Harlan. I wasn't um, able to get this into an editable format, so I won't be able to edit it while we're talking, yeah. but I have it up on the screen prepared. Um, I did notice, uh, I'll just go first, if that's okay with y'all, I'll, I'll assume rank. On the third line, there is, there should be a space between A and licensed, um, between the licensed midwife, and I would defer to the committee, you know, wordsmithing here, do we want to use licensed twice? She was the daughter of William and Isabella Green. She was educated as a seamstress and a licensed midwife. However, her greatest impact on the town and Charleston community was as a licensed midwife and nurse. I'll throw that out, just uh, other people have things too. And I think one other thing that I saw, um, I think on the, and I'm sorry to, draw, um, to, to make you go back and forth, Philip, on the next to the bottom line, um, Mary Ellen Green, and, and again, there's an, just caught it again, Mary Ellen Green car on the next to the bottom line instead of care. Um, if you see that Mary Ellen Green, it should be, and I don't think there should be an apostrophe after the S in Mary's. And then above in the second paragraph, there should be a comma after however. And Oh, no, I'm sorry, first paragraph. So first Third line, first paragraph. However. Oh, however, comma, yeah. her greatest impact on the town and Charleston community, on the town and Charleston community was as a licensed midwife and a nurse. Maybe I'll real read it out loud just for sense and see if we stumble on something, if that's okay with y'all. Yeah. Mary Ellen Green, born in Charleston on October 11, 1873, came to the town of Maryville after her marriage in 1898 with her husband, Thomas Tobias Carr, in 1905. She was the daughter of William and Isabella Green. She was educated as a seamstress and a licensed midwife. However, comma, her greatest impact on the town and Charleston community was as a licensed midwife and a nurse. Thoughts on that paragraph? I'm not crazy about the however in there. And I don't think we need license twice. So I would propose uh, that last sentence be added to say, she was educated as a seamstress and midwife, comma, but her greatest impact on the town, so on. On the town. And, and do you need an article in front of Charleston? The sure, let's add in an article. We're getting rid of however, right? So, point of clarification is is the training for a midwife separate from training as a nurse? Is it a subset of nursing or is it a separate profession entirely? I don't know. It is, yeah, yeah, I okay. think they're two separate, two separate professions, correct? Okay, thank you. So I'll read the second paragraph and, and we'll recapitulate this. Um, um, Mary Ellen Green Carr practiced her science as a midwife and nurse for over 25 years while also serving as the town of Maryville's Registrar of Vital Statistics, bringing over 600 babies, both black and white into the world. She saw to their care and health and that of their parents and others. She certified babies to ensure that all had legal birth certificates. Mrs. Carr also served on the town's public board of health and acted as a medical examiner responsible for pron pronouncing the deaths and certifying death records for the town. She served as a nurse for Charleston County for many years. Lucille Hamilton was another midwife in the town of Maryville. She and Mrs. Carr delivered many babies before African-Americans were allowed to be served in Charleston area hospitals. Councilman. Um. I'm, I'm a little confused of why are we adding, and, and I'm not trying to be exclusive, but we're talking about Mary Ellen Green Carr. Why are we mentioning Lucille Hamilton? I'll defer to the experts. 
Yeah. Um, and then the second question is, as a nurse for Charleston County, Charleston County Health Department, Charleston County Hospital, Charleston County Schools, or Charleston County what? She, she, oh, that, that, can you uh, repeat gotcha. the question? Yeah. Right. So, so she served as a nurse for Charleston County. Charleston I County. I think the what? councilman's question is it count, is it the Charleston County Health Department or is it so who licensed her? Was it a county license? Is that what you're asking? No, ma'am. On the third line from the bottom going up, it says she served as a nurse for Charleston County. County. Charleston County School District, Health Department. The, the, the county of Charleston. Would, would, would it be changed if we said in Charleston in, County? In. in. And then you would not need to know a department. We don't know if she served as a with the Charleston County Health Department. Just in Charleston County. Just in Charleston County. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Okay. Yeah. So if we change it to N, I think that. In, in, in Charleston County. And basically, it's Charleston County residents, I guess, what we're trying to say, but that would be adding a word. She served as a nurse for Charleston County residents, but that, again, that would be adding a word instead of. Um, Mm -hmm. Any other yeah. thoughts on that paragraph? Uh, Mr. Green. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm here to make comments about um, the addition of the sentence on Lucille Hampleton. Okay. Uh huh. And what the thought was is that we want to wanted to show that there was another midwife in the community uh, who also served, and um, to give her recognition. Uh, the history shows that. She worked with Mary Ellen Green at some point. Uh, and um, so she also uh, participated as a, a midwife for the community. As you know, during those years, uh, Blacks were not allowed to be served by the hospitals in the Charleston area. And so because of that, um, of course, uh, Mary Ellen Carr, was the key person, but Lucille Hamilton also served as a midwife and we wanted to include her right. and that to show right. that. Mm -hmm. So possibly one way we could do that instead of um, instead of giving her a sentence, we could say, you know, um, she served as a nurse for in Charleston okay. County for many years, along with Lucille Hamilton, comma, Mrs. Carr delivered many babies before African Americans were allowed to be served in Charleston area hospitals. That would put the information in there, but not give um, Mrs. Ham Miss Ham um, Lucille Hamilton a sentence of her own. So we would get the information with less words, um, and and still and still the focus would be on Mary Ellen Green Carr um, if we put um, her in a dependent clause. Okay. So um, any other thoughts on that paragraph? I'll go to the next if people Mr. don't. Chairman, yes, sir. We go through that entire paragraph, and there's no date, no year. But we talk about her, her um, marriage and her birth earlier. Is there a place in here that it would be a meaningful uh, date? I know most of this is a range of time. Or did we say beginning? So and so she was a midwife and nurse, or some something just to give it a little chronological uh, context. Um, and I'm not sure if people here have an answer for that. I do know that in the other plaques, we will see how long the town of Maryville was incorporated. So that would give somebody a time span if they're going through the entire park. And I also think in the list of, I'm not sure if she's listed on the list of um, office holders, which I think I did bring with me, which we're not ruling on today or are voting on today. But if that was the case, then the information would exist in the park, um, but possibly not on the plaque. Unless people know exactly when she did, you know, like I said, if she was, um, you know, when she was registrar or when she was on the town's board of health. And forgive me as I fumble through my pieces of paper. Yeah, so let's see. Um, so there are listed people that will be on the um, Board of Health, um, on the mayors and elected officials of the town of Maryville. Um, and 
but again, I don't see, see if I see her listed. Miss Clark, I don't know if you've got or a or. So I see her husband listed as mayor on the list of. So is that an issue to people here, commissioners or people listening? Do we have a date span? It's just obvious, so obviously missing. So, yeah, yes, ma'am. And if you, yeah, if you don't mind coming up to the microphone so we can all hear. Um, number one, going back to the first paragraph, the second um, line, uh, the cars moved to the area in 1904, not 1905. Okay. And in doing the earlier research about the creation of the list, um, Mrs. Call was not included on that. Um, however, I only found one piece of document um, where she signed off in 1935 on the death certificate for Milton Grant, who oh. was the mayor in 1926. So I didn't have any documentation that she served in this capacity. So that's why I did not include her on the list. And gotcha. I created the list all except the last name that was added um, there. Gotcha. Well, thank, thank you, you for that. So we got another correction in paragraph one, but we don't necessarily have a response. Do we know that if she started, if she moves in, okay, she marries in, she comes in 195, do we think that she started, 194, um, do we think she started practicing then in 194, like as soon as she came to Maryville? Do we have any idea of the, if we have a date range, it'd be great to put that in there, but failing a date range, um, if we don't have that information, Someone with a big folder. <laughs> uh, my name is Della Carr Jordan. I am a descendant of the Carr family. Um, I can get those dates if we can revisit this uh, to clarify the 1904 versus 1905, as well as those dates that she was there and uh, acting as, I mean, as a midwife. Um, I don't have those exact dates. Um, I did have 1905, so I would need to definitely look into that yeah 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 um I would like for her name to be added to the plaque she did serve that yeah and the great thing is we're not we're not ruling on this one today okay. so there is time for this to come okay. back I was just, like I said that was just included to us for information um and um no that's okay <laughs> we got another paragraph there's there's still another chance yeah. And so then there's another paragraph and she herself was a mother, Mary Ellen Green Carr and Thomas Tobias Carr Sr. had a total of 14 children, seven of whom grew into adulthood. Isabel Rosetta was the oldest, followed by Tobias Jr., comma, William Jackson, comma, Leroy Ashley, comma, Frank Nathaniel, comma, Mary Ruth. And I don't think we need a semicolon after Ruth. It probably should be a comma, you know, and their youngest. And I don't think we need the word child. Um, and their youngest, comma, John Wesley Sr. They were members of the community church, Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Ashleyville. Mary Ellen Green Carr died on August 21st, 1963. She was one of the three important Marys of the town of Maryville. She rests in Ashleyville's Browns Cemetery. I'd also like to ask, if I may, um, the children that lived, I'd like to be able to add, and maybe in parentheses, the spouses, they also lived in the Ashleyville area. I'd like to be able to maybe add their names as well. Uh, Mildred, Bertha, uh, Charles, uh, there are three others or so. Uh -huh. Would that be possible? Um, I'm seeing some head nods. I think it's a matter of space. Uh -huh. And I also think it's a matter of parity since it really is on her and you know, and it's her accomplishments, and certainly giving birth to children is an accomplishment. But you know, then the children go on and marry who they want to marry. And I just think then it gets kind of like the begats in the Bible. That's my kind of um, um, you know um, spin on it. And I would open it up to other commissioners because um, again, you know, we have always debated here too that we try to be as succinct as possible and get the most important information up top because we just. 
unfortunately don't have faith in human beings to read all the information and digest it. And I think just seeing an enormous amount of information, people's eyes are going to um, glass over. But again, I think we want to keep the focus on her if I'm speaking for um, the commission. I just think that those people were significant in yeah. the neighborhood, in the right. community itself. Right. Right. And that's who we're talking about as well, right. is, is Maryville as well. Right. And, you know, if they were on a board or, you know, if they if they can be incorporated in other text anywhere. Um, David, excuse me. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to go to another point. Sorry. Okay. Um, the last sentence, I think, should be two sentences. She was one of the most important, of three important Marys with no um apostrophe of the town of Maryville period she rests in Ashleyville's Brown Cemetery I don't think a semicolon is proper in that context of the sentence mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Other... augmenting David's uh observation there how about if we combine the last clause with the first clause Mary Ellen Green Carr C-A-R-R -R, right died on August 21st, comma, 1963, comma, and rests in Ash Ashleyville's Brown Cemetery, period. That'd be fine. Same, and then, same. and then a yeah. complete sense. The only other one is... And then she was one of the three important, important Marys of Maryville, of the town of Maryville? Yes. yes. Okay. The only other comment I have is she herself, that's kind of an awkward phrase so where i'm sorry well, where I, is she herself i'm just gonna suggest that we remove that sentence since we list all of her children Either i don't that know that it's necessary she was also a mother but she herself oh that's just an awkward context. well beginning a sentence with a, a paragraph with she is a little awkward so if you removed that sentence and just started with mary ellen green carr and thomas carr and thomas carr had a total of 14 children i right. think people will realize she was a mother yes. yeah yeah i agree i was i was going to actually do that but then i was afraid somebody would say i was against motherhood no that's because a woman <laughs> is talking <laughs> are there other thoughts i'll give you all a few minutes councilman uh, we didn't mention anything beyond her husband being thomas tobias carr was he he was mayor, is that correct? So, I mean, that was, a, I mean, I know it's sort of mentioned later on, but should that be included in this plaque? Yeah. Angela says it's not about him, it's about her. Yes. <laughs> but he was a mayor. He makes it in matching. No? So, I mean, the quickest way to do it would, you could just, you know, if we went back to the second line, it would be with her husband, Mayor Thomas Tobias Carr in 1905. Although he's not mayor in, he's, he's intendant or mayor in what, um, 20, 1934 to 36, right, right. Would that be it? So would that throw people off if we said with her husband, Mayor Thomas Tobias Carr in 1905, although he's not mayor he's until the mayor. 1930s? He wasn't mayor for 14 children, he? Right. Future mayor. But he's not mayor until the 30s, right? Right, future mayor, right. That's true. So. Future mayor. That would be the least amount of words. That would only, only be true if all the children were born after he was mayor. Is he getting his own plaque? Is he getting his own plaque? Okay, so as long as he's being acknowledged somewhere else, and I'm assuming on his plaque, they're mentioning his spouse, or, you know... Well, they didn't have all the 14 children in the spans that he was the mayor. <laughs> see what you've done? Yeah. Let's just see where we can. Um...
So, I mean, is it an issue? Do we want to include mayor in the plaque if he's going to have his plaque on his own? I mean, the thought is that Angela seems to suggest that it's about her and, and he's mentioned. So, um, okay. Okay, do we have a second? And shall I read it for clarity, Philip, or do you think you have it all? Uh, who was Any more discussion? second again? So um, David McCormick, um, who seconded it? Counts? Mickey, with, with, yeah, there was, there was a fight for who was gonna second it, right? <laughs> and then if you, if you have everything that you've written yeah. out. So if I can read it out loud, and if you all will go along with me as well too. Um, so Mary Ellen Green Carr, midwife and nurse, Mary Ellen Green Carr, Mary Ellen Green, comma, born in Charleston on October 11, 18, comma, 1873, comma, came to the town of Maryville after her marriage in 1898 with her husband, excuse me, comma, with her husband, comma, Thomas Tobias Carr in 1904. Um, well, as long as it's not casting, you know, as long as you're not casting it, which I'm assuming you're not, so we will approve it one way, and if it needs to be um, you know, suggesting now 19, so 1904, um, she was the daughter of William and Isabella Green, period. She was educated as a seamstress and a, and a midwife. Is that right? Or is it no article? She was educated as a seamstress and a midwife. No, A. She was educated as a seamstress and midwife. Yeah, and okay. Um, Next sentence, um, uh, but her greatest impact on the town and Charleston community was at, and the Charleston community was as a licensed midwife and nurse. Do we need a article? And we don't need the article for a in front of nurse, okay? Um, Mary Ellen Green Carr practiced her science as a midwife and nurse for over 25 years while also serving as the town of Maryville's Registrar of Vital Statistics, bringing over 600 babies, both black and white, into the world. She saw to their care and health and that of their parents and others. She certified babies to ensure that all had legal birth certificates. Mrs. Carr also served on the town's public board of health and acted as a medical examiner responsible for pronouncing the deaths and certifying death records for the town. She served as a nurse in Charleston County for many years. Um, along with Lucille Hamilton, comma, Mrs. Carr delivered many babies before African Americans were allowed to be served in Charleston area hospitals. Next paragraph, Mary Ellen Green Carr and Thomas Tobias Carr Sr. had a total of 14 children, seven of whom grew into, it, grew into adulthood. Isabella Rosetta was the oldest, followed by Tobias Jr., William Jackson, Leroy Ashland, Frank Nathaniel, Mary Ruth, and their youngest, comma, John Wesley Sr. And I'm assuming there should be a comma between, um, no, it, between Wesley and Sr. Um, they were members of the community church, Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Ashleyville. And make sure I've got the last sentence right. Um, so was it Mary Ellen Green Carr died on August 21st, 1963? Um, and rests in Ashleyville's Brown Cemetery? And did we want the final line? She was one of the three important Marys, no apostrophe, of the town of Maryville. Period. Period. Amen. One additional correction or addition in the first paragraph, since we have Thomas Tobias Carr Sr. in the third paragraph, we need to put Thomas Tobias Carr Sr. in the first paragraph. So second line. Yes. So Thomas Tobias Carr, comma, senior in 1904. <laughs> so that's our amend, that's our, um, we have that on the floor. Um, there's no more discussion. Can we have a show of hands to vote for that? Any nays? Any abstentions? Mary number two. Mary Matthews just. I'll throw out my questions right now while y'all maybe um, think about it as well. And maybe, so do for the title, um, Mary Matthews just a leader and the soul of Maryville, does the need to be capitalized and is soul in quotation marks? Yeah. 
Other thoughts? And quotation marks, Dale, for soul? Yes, sir. Okay. Mary Matthews, just a leader and soul of Maryville or the soul of Maryville? I would suggest the because leader and soul, it, you know. Um, Hard. You know about the title, you ought to do it consistent with the first line of the plaque. Right. Mary Matthews just was, again, quote, the soul, uncapitalized of the town. And I don't think, do we need to capitalize the in the town? I don't think so. Um, this petite woman of color was listed in, I would say, the city directory, 1886. I would say in the 1886 Charleston City Directory because you know Maryville is not Charleston we're making the and we're making the inference that she was listed downtown so I would suggest you know um, you know that the, again the the 1886 Charleston City directory as an entrepreneur selling milk cream and butter she was also a dressmaker teacher landowner I looked it up landowner is one word believe it or not um, um, and property owner at 99 Calhoun Street my question is, um, so, I mean, what's the difference? What's the difference? I mean, property these days is either real property or like a car or something like that. So, can we just say that she was listed as a either property owner or land owner at 99 Calhoun Street? Is there a differentiation between land and property, David? Well, there may be, but if you said uh, that she was a landowner, comma, including property at 99 Calhoun Street, you can finesse the issue. Or a landowner of property? No. No. Just landowner. She was a dressmaker, teacher, landowner, comma, including property at 99 Calhoun Street. So she was a dressmaker, teacher, landowner. And landowner, comma, including property at 99 Calhoun Street. But the and before land. Okay. And, and landowner, land comma. Land including property at 99 Calhoun Street. But the and goes before land. Owner. Gotcha. I'm going to go to the second paragraph. She married Charles Augustus Just Jr., who was from a prosperous wharf building family on September 19, 1878. They had six children, three of whom died before reaching the age of five. Surviving children were Inez, Hunter, and Ernest. After the death of her husband and father-in-law in 1887, Mary sued her father-in-law's estate and received $200. She then moved her family to St. Andrew's Parish where she obtained employment in the new fertilizer industry. She encouraged the men of the town of Maryville to process the moss from the trees to make mattress filling. As one of the leaders of the community, she was often asked to address neighborhood meetings. Dale? So I would suggest that early in that sentence, after the death of her husband and her father-in-law, otherwise- It sounds like it's the same person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Not true. That is, yeah. And I would also suggest maybe in the final line, as one of the leaders of the community, instead of saying she was asked to address neighborhood meetings, I'm assuming she did address neighborhood meetings. So to me, it makes it stronger. As a leader of the community, she often addressed neighborhood meetings and you save a few words. Do y'all feel there's a disconnect between, um, she then moved her family to St. Andrew's Parish where she obtained employment in the new fertilizer industry. And then the next sentence that says she encouraged men of the town of Maryville to process the moss from the trees what trees and does that relate to fertilizer in any way or is that completely independent right if you yeah. add the word also she That's also encouraged the men add also after she she also or right. also she either one she also encouraged the men of the town of maryville to process the moss um or we could just say tree moss yeah just tree moss it's a little shorter spanish moss. huh spanish moss well, people know what that sure means. Are sure it was just Spanish moss? I would think that's the last I thing that's stuck in Africa. I don't think you could do that little green moss that grows on the tree. 
So we have tree moss or Spanish moss. I'm not a herbologist. I would say, you know, again, if you're thinking that people don't, you know, if they're not from Charleston, we call it Spanish moss. I'm not sure if everyone else is going to know that that's what it's called. Um, so I would suggest tree moss. I'm only doing this to move things along. So the year 1892 was a very productive year for Mary Matthews Just. According to the Berkeley County Record of Deeds Office, she leased land from Charlotte Green in the town of Maryville. In addition, she was unanimously elected postmistress for the town of Maryville's post office. And I can just say, we don't need to say found, you can say at Mary Street, now Mamie Street and Fifth Avenue. And do we need to, um, and sorry, David, I'll ask you, do we need to reference that it's from the Berkeley County Records of Deed Office? I mean, is it important that she leased land? I'm just curious. And it's, it's, not, it's not in Berkeley County. Well, it was at the time, I think. It, right, it moved no, back it was, and forth. It was Berkeley County in 1891 was east of the Cooper. But it was also, believe it or not, down on Edisto. Is it right? And, you know, so, okay. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it, I just it's found a big it mess. Last week. It's and a big political mess. Right. The law was actually Berkeley County. For I don't know that having, you know, yeah. saying. So is that, that important that she leased land? Important. It is. It, okay. It is. And if you tell us why. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think it's important to note that um, the, the land was located in Berkeley County because at that time it was, and then later on it will become a part of Charleston County. So we need to make that distinction, in my opinion. And is that part of the plaque when we go about the history of Maryville itself? As a matter of fact, the documentation for that I found it in Berkeley County at the direct right. at the the uh, Department of Deeds, Deeds office. Right. right. But again, I would argue. Sorry. Um, Dale and then Council. I, I think that's very interesting to think that St. Andrew's Parish, or at least some portion of it, used to be in Berkeley County. It was like the 1880s to the 1920s. And, and I would suggest we would say according to the then Berkeley County record of deeds. Hmm. The then Berkeley County. Well, it's still the Berkeley County deed office. That's where the record is. So maybe instead of saying that, um, um, I worry this is a bit of a tangent and not to the point about her. I mean, right. I mean, again, I would argue, and um, Councilman, did you have your hand up or David? Um, I thought that postal. Um, mistresses or masters or whatever they would be um, were appointed by the federal government. What, what is the idea that some town could elect their own post? I mean, they had to have the ability to have a post office, which I think is federal. And right. so- Yeah, great. I forgot to answer. How did that work? In 1891, um, Mr. Nelson was the postmaster. He was appointed the postmaster. I don't know what happened, but something happened and there was disagreement in the neighborhood, uh, in the town rather. And so the issue was referred to the National Post Office and they told the town of Maryville to go on and find a mayor, I mean, a postmistress. And that's when they held a meeting and she was unanimously elected the postmistress mm -hmm. for the post office in Maryville. That's great. And I do think postmistress <laughs> is one word, um, as postmaster is, I think. Well, I'm glad you clarified. That's great. Oh, yes, um, I found this in the, the news and Corey was so helpful and yeah. still is. I spend my days reading the 1880s, 1800s, late 1800s. Of course, it sounds like I'm reading 2023 when you look at the issues, but. <laughs> when yes. did it be so good today? Yes, I could, I could share the article. With right, you. yeah. Yes. So, I mean, I, I, am, I am kind of agreeing with Angela that seems the fact that she leased land um, from a particular person and the fact that it was in Berkeley County seems to take um, the spotlight off of Mary Matthews Just. And when we go back to the town of Maryville and do its plaque, I think we can talk that it was moved from Berkeley County to Charleston County. 
um, unless there's a strong thing. Because again, we're trying to focus on her and we're trying to give her, you know, I mean, you could say the year 1892 was a very productive year for Mary the Master's Just. She leased land from Charlotte Green and was unanimously elected postmistress, or we don't need Charlotte Green. Again, I think that unless Charlotte Green is someone significant, you know, to her. So I think we could say the year 1892 was a productive year for Mary Matthews Just. She leased land and and was unanimously elected postmistress for the town of Mary, and, and, and you know, and, and elected postmistress for the town um, at or the town of Maryville's post office and uh, at Mary Street, now Mamie Street and Fifth Avenue. Other people have thoughts on that? Yeah. Sienna, with regard to the... Um... Actually, you could continue it on because the next paragraph starts 1892 as well, too. You could say, so the year 1892 was a productive year for Mary Matthews Just, according, you know, she leased land from, she leased land in the town and was unanimously elected postmistress for the town of Maryville's um, post office found at Mary Street, now Mamie Street, Fifth Avenue. The same year, Mary Matthews Just, Reverend Clinton Rowe, and Joseph C. Berry, the trustees, bought land from Mary Bowen. And it, is it is it Bowen's or Bowen? It's just S. It, there's no S. Is that right? Yes. There should be no S. It was Christopher Columbus Bowen, not but not Bowen. So, right. So maybe we could combine those, you know, just make one paragraph um, on Fifth Avenue for $55 for a school which which was named um, for a northern philanthropist. I don't think you need A, which was named for northern philanthropist Frederick Deming Jr. Mrs. Just taught classes, served as principal, and conducted religious sessions on Sundays. She also bought fire insurance to protect the building. Her passion for education was demonstrated when she sent her 13-year-old son, Ernest Everett Just, to a new preparatory school connected with a brand new college, the Colored Normal Industrial Agricultural and Mechanical College, which opened in 1896 in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Later, the institution became known as South Carolina State College and today South Carolina State University. Mrs. Mary Matthews, Mrs. Mary Matthews married her second husband, Mr. George Williams, and they had a son. She died March 9, 1902, and is buried in Mother Emanuel's AME Church Cemetery. Is that Charleston's Mother Emanuel? Yes, so that is Mother. But Mary Matthews just was So, so Mrs. Mary Matthews just married, right? But is there also an Emmanuel Church in Maryville? Yeah. Right. Right. So my thought, so do we need to draw attention? I mean, are people going to know? We know that Mother Emanuel is on Calhoun Street, but people not reading this, they may think that she's buried in, in Emmanuel Church in Maryville. So... Right, but I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I said, we know it's Mother Emanuel, but I think if a tourist stopped by or, you know, I don't think they would, you know, you know if there wasn't another Emanuel in, in Maryville. Right, and we can say, and, and so what was that? And Mary buried in Charleston in Mother Emanuel Church Cemetery or buried in Charleston's Mother Emanuel? Okay, right. Anybody want to? Right, and we've cut that. We've cut that phrase out by basically saying the year of eighteen ninety two was a productive year for Mary Matthews. Just we're basically saying she leased land, and she leased, you know, in eighteen ninety, she leased land and was unanimously elected postmistress. So we decided to take the deed office reference out. Mickey? Can you need that Mr. George Williams? Or can you just say second husband George Williams? Right, do we need the Mr.? Right. Sure, yes. I, mean, yeah, I mean, I think. Okay. Yeah. So I know we're all getting tired. Um, do people see anything else to suggest? Yeah. 
If not, they well, just um, if you want to save a few words, the last sentence in that earlier paragraph. Later, the institution became South Carolina State College, and today is South Carolina State University. So she connected with a brand new college, the Colored Normal Industrial Agricultural Mechanical College, um, which opened in 1896 in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Later, later the institution became South Carolina State College, and today is South Carolina State University. Oh, so you're basically just saying put is in front of. And take out known as. Okay, gotcha. So later the institution became South Carolina State College, and today is South Carolina State University. Okay. Yep. Chair, chairman, excuse me, council member. You the chair. I'm the chair. You the chair. Okay. So um, I'm a little confused about one, this sort of getting off the subject about Mary Matthews Just, but her son, Ernest Everett Just, has his own history. Right. Am I, am I right on that? that is He'll certainly have his plaque, right? The black and, and I'm not sure, are we doing a plaque for him as well? I, I, I want to get clarification on him. If I, if, if I might add, uh, Mr. Green, um, at the aquarium, uh, it has been requested that a marker is developed in his honor. And so that's being addressed uh, currently. Great idea. So that uh, so that we are, uh, that was suggested by us, and so that they are working on that, um, going through the process of getting it approved, um, because the property where the aquarium is located, then along to the aquarium, I don't understand all of that, but anyhow, they can't put it on the outside, so the plan is to put it on the inside of the of the aquarium. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so, but anyhow, we've requested that uh, so that he would get recognition right. for his contributions. Right. right. And and Donna Jacobs wants to speak. But is there going to be a plaque for Ernest Everett Just in the Maryville thing at all? Because, and I think the family lived near on Inspection Street for a while too, and that was near the aquarium. The Omega Sci Fi fraternity uh -huh. has a plaque for him on Inspection Street. It's tiny. It's tiny. It, it's right. tiny. It's under a bush and it's right across. Is that a Moja edge. thing? I think it, it It looks like a Moja plaque, I think. It's one of those uh, small. Not really. I think it was sponsored by Omega Sci Fi. I don't uh -huh. think it has a lot of detail. Right. Um, and so, but it, it does exist right. on that essentially place. where they best can identify where the house right. was across from Ted. It, Ted's picture block right. on inspection. Street. Yes, if, sir. if I may, Donna, while you're here, where is it? Where is that plaque located? Do you know where Ted's butcher block is? Yeah, the street that leads into that parking lot. Yeah, the street that right there. It, it's there's a, a really oh. nice bush that's so overgrown that you don't see the marker on the road. Because I I just recall meeting with members of the fraternity who were interested in this plaque, and as we were going through the the Carl Richardson landscape before it was being developed that was a important issue that his marker was going to be placed at this park so so something changed with that uh, yes, what, what it is is that we certainly agree that uh Ernest Everett just should receive recognition uh however we felt that it would be more appropriate in the area of the aquarium because he was a marine biologist and that was his area and that was his contribution. And so um, to, to uh, so we felt that it would be uh, more appropriate there, but uh, to give him, you know, his due recognition um, because of his profession. Now, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, um, they do have, um, a lecture series named in his honor. Um, and so his recognition is coming in the area of him being a marine biologist. And so 
what we were trying to do is to encourage recognition in that area um, and in the aquarium area. And the, and the reason I'm bringing this up, Mr. Chairman, is that, and I know the focus for this plaque is for her, but he was such a prominent- I, I, I agree. And, and there's no, I mean, it just mentions his right. name. I mean, it seems that we're giving more attention to the school that he went to rather than himself. There's like, X, there's, a, there's like 60 words or 30 words related to the school instead of him. And I think that could be, um, you know, if we didn't, you know, um, was demonstrated when she sent, you know, you know, her 13 year old son, future marine biologist, black Apollo of science, Ernest Everett Just to don't, um, okay, but, but would it be appropriate to put something there, you know, you know, her 13 year old son, Right, future, you know, future, whatever. Right, you know, and we want to call him Black Apollo of Science, which he's often called, you know, too. And I would say, you know, the, you know, the, the brand new, and I would just say, the brand new colored normal industrial agricultural mechanical college. I don't think we need to put in opened 1896 in Orangeburg. It's not about, it's, you know, it's not about South Carolina State. It's, you know, if we put more words in there about Edward Edward Just, instead of the school, um, you know, and we could just say, you know, and, and you know, um, the, the South Carolina, sending him to the Colored Normal Industrial Agricultural Mechanical College in Orangeburg, South Carolina, now South Carolina State University, you know, but we would put, we would put the positive in there, basically say, you know, she sent her 13 year old son, future developmental biology, what, cell biologist? Are you gonna quote Wikipedia at me? His background is in developmental biology, okay. and it's the medical university that does a symposium every year right. on developmental biology based okay. on his work. So, so, and do we want to include Black Apollo of Science in quotes? Yeah. Right, right, and that's you know, I mean, and that's I mean, and but did so he so did he live briefly in Maryville? Yes. Okay. Did. Well, I. He went to Deming. Yeah. So you want that to read that since we're talking about him as a 13-year-old son, then after after the name Ernest Everett Just, then then to say who became a renowned. So you could so you could do that, or you could say 10 or 13-year-old son Everett Just to a new preparatory school. Um, the Colored Normal Industrial and Agricultural Mechanical College, today South Carolina State University. Edward Everett Just, you know, okay. went on to become a uh, the, Edward Everett Just, comma quotation marks. The Black Apollo of Science was later, you know, became you know famed developmental scientist. Right. Yes. That's what, okay. So that would be and the again, last sentence if, of that paragraph, and you just shrink all the stuff about South Carolina State. Right. Got it. Okay. Yeah. If someone wants to either discuss more or make a motion, we can try to get all this together and pass it. <laughs> or pass out, whichever comes first. No, I'm asking for someone. If, pass someone, out. <laughs> if someone wants to make a motion, I will try to. If someone wants to make a motion and second it, then I will try to read back the entire motion that we're so, are. So moved. Okay, second. Okay, I think this is it, Philip. Mary Matthews just a leader and not capitalize the soul in quotation marks, a leader and the soul of Maryville. Mary Matthews just was the soul in quotation marks of the town, not capitalized T in town, the town of Maryville. The petite woman of color was listed in the 1886 Charleston City Directory as an entrepreneur selling milk, cream, and butter. She was also a dressmaker, teacher, and landowner, including property at 99 Calhoun Street. She married Charles Augustus Just Jr., who was from a prosperous wharf building family on September 19, 1878. They had six children, three of whom died before reaching the age of five. Surviving children were Inez, Hunter, and Ernest. 
after the death of her husband and her father-in-law in 1887, Mary sued her father-in-law's estate and received $200. She then moved her family to St. Andrew's Parish, where she obtained employment in the new fertilizer industry. She also encouraged the men of the town of Maryville to process tree moss to make mattress filling. As one of the leaders of the community, she often addressed neighborhood meetings. The year 1892 was a very productive year and I think we can just say, maybe say 1892 was a very productive year for Mary Matthews Just. She leased land in the town of Maryville and was unanimously elected postmistress, one word, for the town of Maryville's post office at Mary Street, now Mamie Street and Fifth Avenue. In the same paragraph, in the same year, Mary Matthews Just, Reverend George Clinton Rowe and George Joseph C. Berry, the trustees, bought land from Mary Bowen, B-O-W-E-N, Taft on Fifth Avenue for $55 for a school which was named for Northern philanthropist Frederick Deming Jr. And it is only one M in Deming? Yes. Okay. Um, Mrs. Just taught classes, served as principal, and conducted religious sessions on Sundays. She also bought fire insurance to protect the buildings. Her passion for education was demonstrated when she sent her 13-year-old son, Ernest Everest Just, to a preparatory to a new preparatory school connected with a brand new college, the Colored Normal Industrial agricultural and mechanical college, today South Carolina State University. Ernest Everett Just, comma, quotation, the Black Apollo of science, comma, quotation mark, um, and became, uh, was, became a, a leading developmental biologist. Okay, became, became, became one of America's leading biologists. Okay, and next paragraph, Mrs. Mary Matthews just married her second husband, Mr. George Williams, and they had a son. She died March 9th, 1902, and is buried in Charleston's apostrophe, Mother's Emanuel AME Church's Cemetery. Uh, Mr. Chen, on the um, why not have after the after a thirteen year old son Ernest Everett Just in opposition a future renowned pioneer in we, cell biology? We we decided he gets his own sentence because because um, because we have to say that he went to the Colored Normal Industrial Agricultural Mechanical College, later South Carolina State. Period. Then we give him an entire sentence, not just a dependent clause, saying Ernest Everett Just, comma, Black Apollo of Science, you know, became one of America's leading biologists. Became, we feel, uh, became a future renowned pioneer in cell biology. Right. Yeah. But again, but we're giving him a full... Not, his career wasn't just limited to the United States, either. Well. Yeah. So, the, um, so it's, it's, he's, a, he's, he's a pioneer in the field. Right. Uh, uh, university. So, um, that that's the important thing to me. Um, I think this man is really a statue, given what he contributed to, to right. cell biology. Very few people are able to do something that touches touches right. everyone in the I world. I mean, he's got a stamp. He's great, he, uh, right? And he was able to do that. So um, I'm I'm hoping that that they do pay due attention to to understand right. right. And I think this and, will uh, help. Yeah. This will help getting information on him in the in the immensely. right of his contribution. Right. So we have the motion. We have the second. Mickey? Um, uh, up, uh, one, two, three, four, five. The sixth sentence after the death of her husband and father-in-law, should that not be after the deaths? Yes. Should be for after the Thank death. you. Yes, the plurals. After the deaths and that. So we'll go back after the deaths of her husband and her father-in-law in 1887. Thank you, Mickey. Mm -hmm. So we, yes, sir. Uh-huh. 
to start 1892, to not start a sentence with, with numeral. Mm -hmm. So I will go back and say the year 1892 was very productive for Mary Matthews Just. Okay. Go for it. Any more? So any more email? Okay, we've got that motion and it's slowly moving out of the train station. Everyone, uh, screen, every, yes. Can, can I yes, make, uh, have please. a question, please? Sure. Um, in reference to Mother Emanuel, right. in that area, can you state Mother Emanuel on Calhoun Street? Because Emanuel AME in Ashleyville is also in Charleston. Right. And so it will make a distinction if you say Mother Emanuel on Calhoun Street. Uh, you know, yeah, how, whatever yeah, yeah. wording you come up with, put Calhoun right. Street in here. Thank you. Right, sure. Or in Charleston or downtown and is buried at, is buried in Mother Emanuel's AME's church. But is the cemetery on? The cemetery is not no. on Calhoun. How about on the downtown cemetery of Mother Emanuel AME Church? Or just downtown is, is buried in the cemetery of Mother Emanuel AME Church on Calhoun Street. It, is it still? I mean, the church is on Calhoun Street, right? That's what I'm saying. But the church is on Calhoun Street. Um, I would say downtown Charleston's Mother Emanuel, or is buried in Mother Emanuel's AME Church Cemetery in downtown Charleston, or downtown Charleston's Emanuel. Mother Emanuel AME Church, downtown Charles, as distinguished from. So the cemetery is up on the neck. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is why I just suggested downtown cemetery. Right. It's amorphous, but also not Maryville. Right. And so, I mean, I mean, technically, I mean, yeah, it is the neck, it is downtown on the peninsula. I mean, people aren't going to know that. So, so, but if, so I think you're saying, Nick, so is buried in downtown Charleston's Mother Emanuel AME Church's Cemetery. Downtown Charleston modifying the church, not the cemetery. Exactly. Okay. Anybody got this? People are going to have the um, anything else to add on? So if people want to signal that by raising their hands or passing out, um, okay, anyone against it? Okay, the third Mary of the Trinity. Mr. Chairman, I need to excuse myself. I'm sorry, I probably okay. have to leave. Thank you for your service. We do have it. We still do have a um, uh, quorum. And this is a shorter one. Yep, right. So Mary Bowen Taft getting and, and then the the under supplied land for, should we say the town? For Mary Bowen Taft Gettings, supplied land for the town of Maryville. Yeah. Mary Bowen yes. Taft Gettings is- All right, I got a question. Okay, sure. Um, both of the other- um, Got it. Plaques included the maiden name of the woman. I know this is a long name, but- in order to be consistent, wouldn't you have it as Mary Moses Bowen Taft Gettings? That might, might, might be a middle name. I don't know. No, she was the daughter of Franklin Moses, who was. And then she married family. many times. Um, yeah. So and Taft was, was a husband, right? Taft was a husband, and Gettings was a husband, right? Um, yeah, you got Mary Matthews Just, and you've got, was it Mary? Was it Green Carr? Well, and I mean, she's called by all of those names at the bottom of the plaque. But I think I think what um, David is saying. Oh, yeah, I agree know, with David but, that okay, right. be consistent. It should be at the beginning right, as well. Right. So Mary Moses Bowen Taft Gettings mm -hmm. supplied right. land for the town of Maryville. Is he capitalized? No. Um, no. I don't think so. But town is yes. right. Um, Mary Bowen Taft Gettings' main contribution to the creation, and again, not capitalized T for the, to the creation of the town of Maryville was supplying the land, part of Hillsborough Plantation, 
which she bought at auction on February 10th, 1880 for $1,350. Well, I also need to add Modus on that line too. Got it. And do you need to have originally part of Hillsborough Plantation? Or was it still Hills, Hillsborough Plantation in, 19, in 1880? I guess it was. About formerly part of Hillsboro. Formerly, okay. Yeah. The land known as, and I'm not sure if, if V is capitalized here, the Lord's Proprietors. And this is a funny thing. I think it's the Lord Proprietors. Yes. S apostrophe. Yes. I think Lord's is plural, not presented. So it's always a tricky one. So Lord should not be possessive, but plural. Yes. And proprietors is possessive S apostrophe. Plural. Well, possessive plural. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So the land known as the Lord's no the Lord's proprietors apostrophe plantation had, had been given. And do we need granted? Granted. Should yes. Be, yeah. Had been granted to Joseph West, the second South Carolina proprietary governor. Um, and and I don't know if we put it in paren. That's where, per, yeah, paren does. Right. March 4, 1671, and maybe just dash. Or do you want to, um, or 2 April 19, 1672, paren, comma, for an experimental farm and a place to live. He also served, you don't need in the position, he also served from August 13, 1674, to April 19, 16, April 19, 1682, and from August 30, 1684, to July 1, 1685. In the parenthetical, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I mean, yeah, I do curious why, I think it's uh, why we need to draw attention so much. I was just gonna say in the parenthetical, if we keep it, I would not have a comma. I know normally you would have a comma after the date as well, uh -huh. but I think when you're doing it from, from A to B, it's just, March 4, right. 1671 to April 19, 1672, and there would not be a comma after, after the paren. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, okay, for an experimental farm and place to live. Because the guy was an important guy, I guess. Right. I mean, so we could cut that. Well, it shows she was, she was pretty important if she could buy proprietary land. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't. Um, She's probably the only woman who did. Probably. I mean, any thought as to what any, um, you know, do we want to give all that information to Joseph West? And we see well, the dates are right. You could, you could just, you just get rid of it with one sentence. The land known as Lord Price had been had been granted to Joseph West, comma the second South Carolina proprietary governor. Er. A South Carolina proprietary governor, period. And right, the second South Carolina. All the dates. If you wanted to, you know, who served various times between March 4, 1671 and July 1, 1685. That's, that does. And so we've got all the information there, but in less words. Right. Um, Mary was born into a well-known political... Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I have really bad peripheral vision. I understand what you are saying about all of this information about Joseph West, but what we were trying to do is to point out and document the link between Charlestown Landing, the founding of Charleston, and what became the town of Maryville, and that the land that Joseph West was given to was located at what is Fifth Avenue and Main Street in that part of land that we now refer to as Ashleyville. So that's why this was so important. And we know that Joseph West appeared to have been the go-to man whenever something was wrong and the proprietors need someone to step up. When William Sale died within a year of becoming the first governor, they went to Joseph West who guided the proprietors here on the voyage here. Mm -hmm. And so that's the point I was trying to make is the connection between the land of Maryville and the connection to the founding of Charleston. Thank you.
Yes. Yeah, then I think we should say that. Right. That's the point I was trying to make. Mr. Chairman, I also, yeah. I also think if we're going to dwell for a minute on the, the fact that it's a Lord's proprietor's plantation, then we need to also address the connection to Hillsboro, because it was known relatively briefly as the Lord's proprietor's plantation and, and for a long period of time as Hillsboro. Right. So, but but that's not included. Probably didn't have the word originally. We say formally. Okay. And this is the point that John made. Uh, so then we should we should stay that. Yeah. So, so uh, there's this connection this far between Reverend Hill and Collins. Right. So, so I so we need to come up with a way to do that. So if we just talk about um, you know, proprietary governor, you know, served various position, you know, served from various times periods from March 4, 1671 to July 1685. Then you have a sentence in there that basically says, you know, the present town of Maryville, or you know, you know, you know, the you know, the present town of Maryville, you know, is is on, is now is, you know, stands on the original, you know, you know, you know, um the original um or annexed to, you know, the original Maryville now stands or something like that, you know, on what was the original site of Charlestown or something yeah, like that. I, I think that that thought needs to be developed. Right. Right. Right there. Right there. Right. David. Also hating to be technical. There was no such creature as South Carolina in 1671 to 1685. It was only one province back then. It right. was Carolina. It was not South Carolina. So it's the second proprietary governor. Yeah. Right. right. That's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. It was it was just one mass of land. But as to his title, it was not South Carolina. Right. So he's the second proprietary governor that who served various was. periods from 1671 to 1685. Um, or you could or served as proprietary governor. And then put whatever dates you want to put in there, because I'm not sure he was maybe the second, but when he was serving later on, he was the right, or fifth right. or sixth or whatever. So, so I'm trying to craft the sentence that would give it to. And again, we want to make the distinction between you know. So the land where Maryville, so we are talking mostly about the land, supplied land for the town of Maryville. So, so we say maybe the town of Maryville incorporates. So is it actually, so it's just, it's just, it's just next to Charlestown Landing where, or was it, you know, it's it's not where Charles it's not where the original settlement was, but it was we could just say making this one of the most you know the first settled, um yeah. you know the first settled the one you know making it one of the first settled areas or I'm not trying to repeat the word area but you know so if if it's the Lord's proprietor and we do know that there was didn't they grow indigo there or something like that later on well when, yeah. right and it was the experimental farm so. The town of Maryville includes part of a 1670s plantation right. known as the Lord's Proprietor's Plantation, which served as an experimental farm and residence of several proprietary era governors in the 1670s and 1680s. Something like that. Um, so, 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 right, 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 or you say it too, which was, you know, you have, which was bought at auction at February 10, 1980 for 1350, that land, some of the earliest settled, um, you know, you know, property in Carolina, 
you know, English, you know, um, was known as the Lord's Proprietor's Plantation, given to Joseph West, a proprietary governor who served something along those Arlen, lines. Arlen, excuse me, could I suggest we defer this until the next batch comes through? Because if I I'm, think we need to, we've been here for a while and we're getting punch drunk with our suggestions. Point of diminishing so, returns. Yeah. And so then we can help you craft that language and have it come back. So when maybe our IQ levels are a little higher, our sugar, right. whatever things are a little higher. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that's an excellent idea, David. Was just that so a motion, give, Mr. McCormick? A second. So we would have a motion to defer this until our next meeting. Um, do we have a second? Any, any discussion? Okay. Call the question. Everyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all well, for your service. I would make one more suggestion in terms of these plaques. We have to come to a consensus of when we use Mrs. and when we use Mr. Definitely there are references to reverends and to other you know, professional titles, but, but all three of them go back and forth in terms of putting either Mrs. before someone's name or Mr. So if y'all could just make, you know, decide which way you want to go, because both are right. It's just make it consistent through the three plaques. So in your absence, Wilmot, we voted to defer this until the next time because we're all getting a little brain dead. Speaking for myself. <laughs> We got pretty far. I, yes, I think I think we've we, we've done that. Yes, a so move to adjourn. Thank you all for your Thank service. You. Sorry, I didn't technically do that. They initially, I got it down to these three. Initially, we were going to do all of them, and I said no way. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. You're very well, Marla. Uh, you should do. You should do audio. <laughs> I just listen to you on the radio. Appreciate the help. Thank you. Sir.